The Best Christmas Pageant Ever by Barbara Robinson. Chapter 5 When we got home, my father wanted to hear all about it. Well, Mother said, just suppose you had never heard the Christmas story and didn't know anything about it, and then somebody told it to you. What would you think? My father looked at her for a minute or two, and then he said, Well, I guess I would think it was pretty disgraceful that they couldn't find any room for a pregnant woman except in the stable. I was amazed. It didn't seem natural for my father to be on the same side as the herdmans. But then, it didn't seem natural for the herdmans to be on the right side of a thing. It would have made more sense for them to be on Herod's side. Exactly, Mother said. It was perfectly disgraceful, and I never thought about it much. You hear all about the nice warm stable with all the animals breathing and the sweet smelling hay, but that doesn't change the fact that they put Mary in a barn. Now let me tell you, she told my father all about the rehearsal, and when she was through, she said, it's clear to me that deep down, those children have some good instincts after all. My father said he couldn't exactly agree. According to you, he said, their chief instinct was to burn Herod alive. No, their chief instinct was to get Mary and the baby out of the barn. But even so, it was Herod they wanted to do away with, and not Mary or Joseph. They picked out the right villain. That must mean something. Maybe so. My father looked up from his newspaper. Is that what finally happened to Herod? What did happen to Herod anyway? None of us knew. I had never thought much about Herod. He was just a name. Somebody in the Bible. Herod the king. But the Herdmans went and looked him up. The very next day, Imogene grabbed me at recess. How do you get a book out of the library? She said. You have to have a card. Well, how do you get a card? You have to sign your name. She looked at me for a minute, with her eyes all squinched up. Do you have to sign your own name? I thought Imogene probably wanted to get one of the dirty books out of the basement, which is where they keep them, but I knew nobody would let her do that. There is this big chain across the stairs to the basement, and Miss Grabner, the librarian, can hear it rattle no matter where she is in the library, so you don't stand a chance of getting down there. Sure, you have to sign your own name, I said. They have to know who has the books. I didn't see what difference it made. Whether she signed the card with her own name or signed the card Queen Elizabeth, Miss Grabner still wasn't going to let Imogene Herdman take any books out of the public library. I guess she couldn't stop them from using the library, though, because that was where they found out about Herod. They went in that afternoon, all six of them, and told Miss Grabner that they wanted library cards. Usually, when anybody told Miss Grabner that they wanted a library card, she got this big happy smile on her face and said, Good! We want all our boys and girls to have library cards! She didn't say that to the Herdmans, though. She just asked them why they wanted library cards. We want to read about Jesus, Imogene said. Not Jesus, Ralph said. That king who was out to get Jesus, Harold. Later on, Miss Grabner told my mother that she had been a librarian for 38 years and loved every minute of it because every day brought something new and different. But now, she said, I might as well retire. When Imogene Herdman came in and said she wanted to read about Jesus, I knew I'd heard everything there was to hear. At the next rehearsal, Mother started again to separate everyone into angels and shepherds and guests at the end, but she didn't get very far. The Herdmans wanted to rewrite the whole pageant and hang Herod for a finish. They couldn't stand it that he died in bed of old age. It wasn't just Jesus he was after, Ralph told us. He killed all kinds of people. He even killed his own wife, Leroy said. And nothing happened to him, Imogene grumbled. Well, he died, didn't he? Somebody said. Maybe he died a horrible death. What did he die of? Ralph shrugged. It didn't say. Flu, I guess. 
They were so mad about it that I thought they might quit the pageant. But they didn't. Not then, or ever. And all the people who kept hoping that the Herdmans would get bored and leave were out of luck. They showed up at rehearsals right on time and did just what they were supposed to do. But they were still Herdmans, and there was at least one person who didn't forget that for a minute. One day, I saw Alice Wendelkin writing something down on a little pad of paper and trying to hide it with her other hand. It's none of your business, she said. It wasn't any of my business, but it wasn't any of Alice's either. What she wrote was, Gladys Herdman drinks communion wine. It isn't wine, I said. It's grape juice. I don't care what it is. She drinks it. I've seen her three times with her mouth all purple. They steal crayons from the Sunday school cupboards, too. And if you shake the happy birthday bank in the kindergarten room, it doesn't make a sound. They stole all the pennies out of that. I was amazed at Alice. I would never think to go and shake the happy birthday bank. And every time you go in the girls' room, she went on, the whole air is blue, and Imogene Herdman is sitting there in the Mary costume, smoking cigars. Alice wrote all these things down, and how many times each thing happened. I don't know why, unless it just made her feel good to see, in black and white, just how awful they were. Since none of the Herdmans had ever gone to church or Sunday school or read the Bible or anything, they didn't know how things were supposed to be. Imogene, for instance, didn't know that Mary was supposed to be acted out in one certain way, sort of quiet and dreamy and out of this world. The way Imogene did it, Mary was a lot like Mrs. Santoro at the pizza parlor. Mrs. Santoro is a big fat lady with a little skinny husband and nine children, and she yells and hollers and hugs her kids and slaps them around. That's how Imogene's Mary was, loud and bossy. Get away from the baby, she yelled at Ralph, who was Joseph, and she made the wise men keep their distance. The wise men want to honor the Christ child, Mother explained for the tenth time. They don't mean to harm him, for heaven's sakes. But the wise men didn't know how things were supposed to be either, and nobody blamed Imogene for shoving them out of the way. You got the feeling that these wise men were going to hustle back to Herod as fast as they could and squill on the baby, out of pure meanness. They thought about it, too. What if we don't go home another way? Leroy demanded. Leroy was Melchior. What if we went back to the king and told on the baby? Where he was and all. He would murder Jesus, Ralph said. Old Harold would murder him. He would not. That was Imogene, with fire in her eye. And since the herdmans fought one another just as fast as they fought everybody else, Mother had to step in and settle everyone down. I thought about it later, though, and I decided that if Herod, a king, set out to murder Jesus, a carpenter baby's son, he would surely find some way to do it. So when Leroy said, What if we went back and told on the baby? It gave you something to think about. No Jesus. Ever. I don't know whether anybody else got this flash. Alice Wendelkin, for one, didn't. I don't think it's very nice to talk about the baby Jesus being murdered, she said stitching her lips together and looking sour. That was one more thing to write down on her pad of paper, and one more thing to tell her mother about the Herdmans, besides the fact that they swore, and smoked, and stole, and all. I think she kept hoping that they would do one great big sinful thing, and her mother would say, Well, that's that, and get on the telephone and have them thrown out. Be sure and tell your mother that I can step right in and be Mary if I have to, she told me as we stood in the back row of the angel choir. And if I marry, we can get the Perkins baby for Jesus. But Mrs. Perkins won't let Imogene Herdman get her hands on him. The Perkins baby would have made a terrific Jesus, and Alice knew it. The way things stood, we didn't have any baby at all. And this really bothered my mother because you couldn't very well have the best Christmas pageant in history with the chief character missing. They had lots of babies offered in the beginning, all the way from Eugene Slopper, who was so new he was still red, up to Junior Cottle, who was almost four, 
his mother said he could scrunch up. But when all the mothers found out about the herdmans, they withdrew their babies. Mother had called everybody she knew, trying to scratch up a baby, but the closest she came was Bernice Waitress, who kept foster babies all the time. I've got a darling little boy right here, Bernice told Mother. He's three months old, and so good I hardly know he's in the house. He'd be wonderful. Of course, he's Chinese. Does that matter? No, Mother said. It doesn't matter at all. But Bernice's baby got adopted two weeks before Christmas, and Bernice said she didn't like to ask to borrow him back right away. So that was that. Listen, Imogene said, I'll get us a baby. How would you do that? Mother asked. I'll steal one, Imogene said. There's always two or three babies in carriages outside the A&P supermarket. Oh, Imogene, don't be ridiculous, Mother said. You can't just walk off with somebody's baby, you know. I doubt if Imogene did know that. She walked off with everything else. We just won't worry about a baby, Mother said. We'll use a baby doll. That'll be better anyway. Imogene looked pleased. A doll can't bite you, she pointed out, which just went to prove that Herdman started out mean right from the cradle.